convocation. Today we are happy to have with us a member of parliament. Uh, they call him MPs, and for the longest time I thought he was a military policeman. He had defended one of the great train robbers, and, and he is was elected in 1966. He's also parliamentary private secretary to the Minister of Defense and British politics. He's also told me that he's uh, Saigon in March as part of the Australian government is sending him again. So would you welcome Mr. Ivor Richard. Well, good morning. Thank you very much indeed. I must say the, uh, the build-ups one gets, really, I, I think I must uh, rewrite it in some ways because every time I hear the sort of blurb that is put out usually by the British Information Service when I go around, uh, I, I feel increasingly embarrassed. <laughs> um, some of the words that are usually said on the blurbs and by the chairman are richly undeserved on my part. For those of you who are interested, however, my client in the great train robbery case uh, is now out. So uh, it, wasn't a <laughs> <coughs> it wasn't an entirely successful defense, however. Uh, what I will do, if I may, this morning is talk for oh, perhaps 25 minutes uh, around some of the problems which are, are facing Great Britain today. Uh, after that, I'll be very pleased to try and answer any questions that you've got uh, either on what I've said or indeed on what I haven't said. <clears throat> um, recently I gave a lecture at uh, a university in Ohio uh, and I started off by saying exactly what I just said to you, that I'd be pleased to answer any questions on what I've said or what I hadn't said. And I then proceeded to talk for about 55 minutes on the problems of associating Britain with the common market, so Britain's joining the European Economic Community. Uh, and then it came to question time, and at the end I said, well, now, are there any questions? And a gentleman at the back put up his hand, and I said, yes, sir. And he said, what about Somaliland? And I looked a bit taken aback and said, well, you know, what about Somaliland? So he said, well, what are you going to do about it? So I said, well, as far as I knew, he was independent, and what did he really want us to do about it? And it emerged after a great deal of probing that uh, he... Britain had apparently colonized that part of Africa in the late 1880s. We had drawn a line on the map which became the southern boundary of Somaliland, that they were in the process of having an argument with Ethiopia about where that boundary ought to run, and please would Britain like to come in, uh, redraw the boundary for them, settle their dispute with Ethiopia, and then withdraw. And it struck me at the time that uh, his question was somewhat disconnected both with what I've been saying about Europe, and I think showed a faint misunderstanding of the powers of an ex-imperial nation like mine in the second half of the 20th century. However, let me turn now to the subject of a changing Britain. I don't know how many of you have actually been to the United Kingdom. Uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, perhaps it would not be right for me, in view of the President's remarks quite recently, to urge you to come, but... Um, <coughs> But if you can somehow or other reconcile your patriotic desire to help the United States balance of payments with your natural wish to come and see uh, my country, we'd be very pleased to welcome you. And I suppose if one had to sum up what the state Britain is in the moment, I suppose one would say that it's in a state of very rapid, very intense change, uh, a very quick transition. All change is difficult. This is one of the axioms of politics, I'm afraid, that if you're going to try and change anything, you have to start off by overcoming a great deal of inertia, and in the process you cause a considerable amount of pain and difficulty. Uh, and change in Britain is no difficult from change anywhere else in the world. Uh, it has created problems, it is creating problems, problems which are sometimes difficult, almost intractable at first sight, but problems which we are beginning to uh, grapple with, and it's some of those problems I want to talk about in a moment. Uh, reading American magazines and newspapers about Europe and about my country, 
And indeed, looking at uh, advertisements put out by uh, that very laudable organization, the British Travel Association, one gets the impression that Britain these days consists of two almost entirely different worlds, neither of which come very much into contact. Uh, there's the world put out by the British Travel Association of Anne Hathaway's cottage at Stratford, uh, of beef eaters in the Tower of London, uh, of perhaps a few smock-coated rustics, you know, leaning over a, 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 a fence, looking at a, a field of English corn ripening under the sun. And then on the other hand, there's the other image that one gets, uh, is of a sort of Nero, uh, almost a national Nero, 54 million of us, all little Neros, fiddling hard, while Rome, the British economy, is burning round our ears. That uh, the image of a swinging London, uh, of a swinging Britain, uh, of the Beatles and Carnaby Street and miniskirts, uh, that this is really what Britain is like today. Um, neither of these images are, of course, wholly true. Like most stereotypes, there's a degree of, tre of, of truth in both of them, uh, and there's a, a monopoly of truth in neither. I must say, though, uh, Britain, at any rate, living in the centre of London as I do, uh, is quite an exciting place these days for a male. Um, Mini skirts are very definitely in. Uh, I, I must reassure, however, some of the younger males in my audience, well, not reassure them, I must give them a solemn warning that these days in the King's Road in Chelsea, one sees the emergence of a new phenomenon which is called the maxi skirt. Uh, it's really very really odd sometimes to walk in the middle of Chelsea to see two girls, one with a dress down to her ankles and the other with a dress up to her thighs. And uh, the contrast is, is sometimes uh, rather shaking. Um, <laughs> it does make driving in London, I'm afraid, a little difficult. But, uh, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, um, there's no doubt, I think, that within the last few years, uh, Great Britain, which I suppose had the image of a rather staid, maiden auntish type of country, uh, has suddenly kicked over the traces, started uh, leading the world in pop music, started producing rather exciting fashions for women, started writing uh, some rather interesting and exciting uh, plays, poetry, uh, music, uh, and really seems to have emerged and blossomed at any rate into a 20th century culture uh, within the last uh, five or ten years. But uh, being a politician, may I turn for a moment to perhaps the more sobering parts of British life today? Because not only, do, not only is this image of a swinging London, as I said, and a swinging Britain, valid to a certain extent, but of course Britain is now a very exciting place to live in, both uh, technologically, both politically and socially. But it does have its problems. And I want for a moment, therefore, to examine some of the problems, particularly the economic ones. Uh, and then I want to say a, a few words about Britain's role in the world, her status, her position in uh, the 20th century world. Uh, and finally, I want to say one or two words, if we have time, about the sort of society uh, that I live in at home. First of all, let me deal with the uh, economic side of it. I suppose that there are three facts of life as far as the British economy is concerned, which exist irrespective of whichever party is in government. At the moment, my party has got a majority in the House of Commons. We have a majority of around 90. Uh, when the Conservatives were in, before 1964, their majority was uh, around 100. But the three facts, economic facts of life that I'm going to talk about in a moment, have existed certainly since 1945, since the end of the last war, uh, and they are facts which, within which whichever party is in government has to operate. You can't operate outside them. There are limitations, therefore, upon one's economic and political freedom of action. And the three facts are these. Britain cannot feed its population. This is nothing to do with how efficient British agriculture is, Indeed, it's the most efficient, the most highly mechanized, the most highly industrialized, certainly in Europe, uh, and probably it compares very favorably indeed with any nation on earth. But because of the size of my country, because of the sheer geographical limitation on the number of acres that you have got that you can put under a plow, and because of the fact that we have 54 million people living on these, com 
not really large islands. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that Britain can only feed around 60% of its people. That's by homegrown food. And of course, the way in which traditionally, therefore, we eat is by exporting goods. Britain lives on the export performance of British industry. That's what feeds the 54 million people that live in the United Kingdom. It would be totally impossible for Britain to retire behind a, a massive tariff wall, uh, erect some kind of barrier between itself and the rest of the world, retire behind it, and then try and go on existing. We couldn't do it. Uh, the United States, in terms at any rate, of producing enough food to feed its population could do it. Uh, and therefore, the first and most important single economic fact of life for Great Britain is that in order to eat, we have to export. And the second economic fact of life, as far as my country is concerned, is that we are one of the two reserve and trading currencies. The dollar is, of course, the other one. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in this connection, I was at uh, Detroit Airport yesterday, and I passed a, 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 a newspaper stand, in which there were a lot of newspapers, and I looked down and I saw a headline, uh, and uh, the headline read, Stern Action Needed to Restore the Balance of Payments. And it all seemed dreadfully familiar, and it was only about ten seconds later and five steps onward that I realized they were talking about you and not about us. Because this is the sort of thing, I'm afraid, the sort of problem Britain has had to live with. Uh, with varying degrees of intensity since 1945. You see, there is no way that I know of, personally, of preventing uh, an Argentinian and a Brazilian, for example, buying and selling their coffee and paying for it in sterling. Uh, there's no way in which I know uh, in which you can prevent them doing it in dollars either. And therefore, the fact that about 40% of the whole of the trade in the world is carried on in pounds in the currency of Great Britain. This makes our currency more vulnerable. It makes our economy more scrutinized. And that's the second fact of life. And the third fact of life, as far as my the economy of Britain is concerned, is that we still have a great deal of overseas commitments, of global commitments throughout the whole of the world. Uh, indeed, British overseas spending is now running at the rate of about 400 million a year. It's a sobering fact that uh, in the middle of the 1930s, when the British Empire was still an old imperial force, supposedly run from Whitehall and supposedly garrisoned and trooped by uh, British forces, that British overseas expenditure then was under 100 million pounds a year. British overseas expenditure now, uh, 30 years, 25 years after the war, despite the fact that we have got rid of almost all uh, of our uh, old colonial empire, our expenditure is nevertheless uh, about four times what it was uh, immediately pre-war. And these three facts, we have to export to eat. We are a reserve and trading currency, and we have a lot of overseas commitments which cost a lot of money. These three uh, interact, the one on the other, and create a great deal of strain on the British economy. Uh, I believe and I have said this often in the United States of America and elsewhere, I believe that the underlying economic performance of Great Britain is fundamentally sound. Uh, I think a great deal of nonsense, frankly, is spoken about the, uh, uh, the economic performance of Great Britain. Uh, if one just looks at two or three key figures, I won't give you too many, but I think it is important, if I may, for a moment, just to give you these figures. Uh, it is a fact that in terms of how much we export how, many of, how much of our manufactured goods we sell abroad, it is a fact that for every man, woman, and child in Britain, we sell more per head than any industrialized nation on earth. In fact, uh, in dollar terms, for every man, woman, and child in Britain, we sell $261 worth per year abroad. The United States, for every man, woman, and child in its population, sells about $150 worth. Now, of course, you sell more because you're a bigger, a bigger nation, but in relative terms, and it's the relative economic performance that is, in, that is important, ours isn't bad. In terms of the percentage of our gross national product that we export, we export around 16% a year, again, a figure higher than any other major industrial nation of comparable size. 
Uh, and I suppose a, a third fact of life as far as Britain is concerned, a third important uh, a key indicator of the real economic strength of my country is the fact that in terms of every man, woman and child in Britain, we have more invested abroad in other countries than any other nation on earth. The basic economic resources of Britain are immensely strong. They are not, if I may say so, immensely weak. And what we have been faced with since the war is the problem of transferring 200 million pounds from one side of a balance sheet to the other side of a balance sheet. It's a very difficult problem, and I don't deny its difficulties, and I don't deny that it is a, a problem that has plagued successive governments now for some time. And it's obviously one which uh, is going to plague my government for uh, a few months, if not years, to come. But nevertheless, in terms of what the problem really is, and in terms of what the basic underlying economic performance of Great Britain is, the problem is not intractable, and the basic economic performance of Britain is not on the whole, uh, I think, bad. And uh, if I can just go on from there for a moment uh, to look at devaluation and the problems caused by it. Uh, we devalued our currency in November by 14.3%, so that the pound no longer buys $2.80 worth. No, the, the rate of exchange is no longer 280. The rate of exchange is now 240. That means, of course, that for every pound that I have, and I change it into dollars, I get 40 cents less than I would have done last November. It also means, however, that if a British car was produced and sold at, say, 1,000 pounds in Britain, uh, it now will be selling for less than it would have sold had the parity remained where it was. In other words, British exports become cheaper, imports into Britain from abroad become that much more expensive. Now, what's happening as a result of this? Uh, I suppose that one can see already the, the, the results from uh, this measure. Uh, one of our biggest car manufacturers is a firm called Leylands. Uh, they make trucks, they make buses, they make Rovers, Triumph, and Jaguars. Uh, their export orders have increased by 46% since November the 20th which was when uh, we devalued. The British Motor Corporation, who make Austins, Morrises, uh, MGs, Wolseleys, uh, they, their projected orders for 1968 show a 40% increase on uh, their export performance for 1967. The British steel industry in 1968 is planning on an increase in its uh, capacity of over 7%. Uh, all the economic indicators tell us that we will get a growth rate in Britain of 4.6% in 1968. So that in terms of how much we're selling abroad, it looks as if devaluation is helping us. But of course it's creating enormous other problems. Particularly, is it creating problems at home? Uh, I'm afraid we're engaged at the moment in a very difficult and rather painful exercise of cutting government expenditure in Britain. Everybody is in favor of cutting government expenditure in the abstract. Nobody is in favor of cutting government expenditure in the specifics. You know, if you go along and you say government expenditure should be cut by 800 or 1,000 million pounds, everybody says splendid and gets up and applauds. If you say to them, but of course that means that we won't be able to build so many hospitals and so many schools, uh, and so many houses, and we won't be able to speed up the road building program, uh, and the welfare services will have to be cut, and you won't be able to spend so much on defending yourselves next year as you did last year, everybody then complains. And each specific lobby, each individual lobby, uh, whether it be for the welfare, or for the school meals, or for the roads, or for the houses, or for the, uh, uh, or for the armed forces, each feels cheated of a certain amount of government cash that it otherwise would have done. As I say, we're going through this exercise at the moment of how you cut and how much you should cut. We will be announcing uh, the results of uh, those decisions. We will, we will be announcing the decisions uh, within the next uh, week or so. And uh, the government has said and been very specific on it. Uh, the prime, way the Prime Minister put it was, nothing is sacrosanct. Uh, each sacred cow is now eligible for the slaughterhouse. And I'm afraid it is going to be a, a rather painful process. All sorts of cherished schemes uh, may end up in the waste paper basket. Uh, it's possible, for example, that we will withdraw from, I'll give you an example which is obviously being considered, 
we will withdraw from uh, the Anglo-French supersonic Concorde airliner. Uh, this would be a great pity. We're about three years ahead of you on this. Uh, on the other hand, it'll cost Britain around five to six hundred million pounds uh, to get the thing fully into production and on sale. Maybe we can't afford that sort of money. It's a difficult and rather painful sort of decision. We're in the process of raising the school leaving age, the age at which uh, children have to stay uh, at school. Uh, it's now 15 in Britain. We want to raise it 16. Now, obviously, if you're going to do that, it means you have to spend more on education. Uh, we may have to postpone raising the school leaving age uh, for a few years. Uh, we have a comprehensive program of building new motorways in Britain. We may have to postpone some of that. Uh, we may have to speed up some defense cuts that uh, we were going to make, such as withdrawing from Singapore, uh, withdrawing our base from Singapore, uh, not by the mid-1970s, but by perhaps 1970 or 1971. Uh, we have already announced a decision not to build an additional aircraft carrier. Uh, aircraft carriers are expensive, desirable, but very expensive. Uh, in terms of uh, how much you have to spend to build them, it's uh, around 60 to 70 million pounds. It costs you around 10 million a year in order to maintain the aircraft carrier. You've then got to have the aircraft to put on the aircraft carrier as well. Uh, the thing tends to snowball. Um, as I say, it's very expensive, very desirable. They're very good weapons, aircraft carriers. They have great advantages over fixed Air Force bases because they can move, and therefore they are less vulnerable. But uh, if you can afford 10 aircraft carriers, which I believe is your program, it makes sense to build them. If you can afford possibly one, well, then we believe that it's balmy, frankly, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to expend so much of our, our resources uh, on building just one aircraft carrier, uh, which will mean that by the late 1970s, the beginning of the 1980s, when the existing ones have been phased out, we will have one. Uh, this, as I say to us, doesn't seem awfully sensible. Now, uh, therefore, the, the main problem with the economy at the moment, the, the things that are going on, are how do you cut government expenditure, how do you therefore channel the resources into a boom which is led by uh, an increase in exports. Uh, I can't give you, of course, any definite uh, um, figures as to how this is going, except the ones that I just have, and they're only indications. Uh, all one can say is, is that for the first time, I believe, for very many years, Britain does have a chance of breaking out of the economic restraints and restrictions which have plagued us since 1945. Uh, devaluation, I don't believe, was a victory for Great Britain. On the contrary, I believe being forced to devalue was a defeat. Uh, we went through a great deal of uh, economic pain in the last three years to try and maintain a parity at 280. Uh, we could not do it. Uh, I suppose we could have borrowed another 1,400 million pounds, which we were offered, in order to try and uh, borrow your way out of the crisis without devaluing. But at some stage or another, I think a country, like an individual or like a company, has to say, uh, we're not going to borrow more money to get out of it. Uh, we're going to take the necessary measures, difficult though they are, painful though they may be, in order to put our house in order so we don't have to go to our bank managers again. Uh, I never thought it was desirable, this was argued in Britain, but I never thought it was desirable that we should try and get ourselves uh, into the position which is envied by every bankrupt, namely that he owes so much money that he, uh, his creditors will go on lending it to him in the hope that at some stage in the future they might get a bit of it back. Uh, this is not unknown in, uh, in corporate finance or in the bankruptcy courts, but it uh, seemed to me a, a somewhat humiliating position uh, and a somewhat degrading posture for a, a country uh, like mine to uh, possibly have to adopt. And therefore, as I say, these were the reasons for the devaluation. This is what we hope will come out of it. Can I turn now briefly to Britain's sort of role in the world and her position in the second half of the 20th century? Um, if, uh, if an intelligent Martian had descended in a flying saucer in November 1964, when the Labour government came in, and if he had been shown a map of the world, and we will assume, first of all, that he can read a map, and we will assume also that he has got a great deal of native Martian intelligence to be able to interpret the facts that are put to him. And he is there shown a map of the world, and he has shown the continent of Europe. And off the continent of Europe, he has shown the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And he sees 
Britain there, 22 miles off the coast of Europe, uh, and he looks into the British position and he finds that there are 54 million people living on this island, uh, very close to Europe, much the same sort of economies as those on the European mainland. And he is then told that for reasons of its own national self-interest, as Britain then saw it, it was necessary for that small island, 22 miles off the coast of Europe, small, I hasten to add in geographical terms only, uh, 22 miles off the coast of Europe, it was necessary for her own national self-interest to have British troops stationed in, and let's work from right to left across the globe, in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in the Pacific, in Singapore, in Ceylon, in Australasia, uh, in New Zealand, in the Indian Ocean, in the Persian Gulf, in Kuwait, in Sharjah, in Bahrain, uh, in Aden, in East Africa, in Central Africa, in Libya, in Cyprus, in Gibraltar, uh, three divisions in Western Germany, the Strategic Reserve in the United Kingdom itself, some more in the Caribbean, and a few odds uh, and bits and pieces in places like the South Atlantic and Antarctica. Now, if our Martian, as I say, was intelligent enough to appreciate those facts and looked at it, he would be forgiven if he asked himself the question, why? <laughs> and if he then went on to be told that in addition to these vast numbers of places, some of them literally on the other side of the globe from Great Britain, uh, he would find that the United Kingdom was with the United States the only member of the three global security organizations, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Europe, the Baghdad Pact, the center organization uh, for uh, the Middle East and the center uh, of the world, and CETA, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, if he was then told that Great Britain had a nuclear capability, both in tactical and in strategic weapons, if he was then told uh, that uh, she had a series of treaty obligations to defend states uh, vast distances away with forces which perhaps she didn't have or couldn't get there quickly enough, uh, if he then found that there were at that moment no less than 60,000 British troops in Malaysia facing uh, Indonesia's uh, aggression, and if he found finally that Britain had a defense budget which was larger than any nation of comparable size, uh, either in Europe or outside Europe, again, he would be forgiven very much if he went on asking himself the questions, why, why, and why? And they are questions which uh, the British government has been asking uh, rather pointedly uh, and rather in, in a great deal of detail since uh, 1964, certainly since we came in. And what we have been trying to do, therefore, is to look at all our commitments right the way across, across the globe. Because, of course, defense, what you spend on defense, follows what your foreign policy commitments are. Defense, the relationship of defense spending and foreign policy is that of servant and master. Uh, you decide as a matter of foreign policy what it is, what interests it is uh, that need to be defended, say in the Far East or in Hong Kong or in Aden, and it is as a result of the foreign policy decisions that you then have to start spending the money. Uh, this, uh, this relationship was one which, frankly, uh, seemed to have got a little bit of out of line as far as Britain was concerned. Defense spending does develop an impetus almost of its own. Generals are awfully good at spending money. Uh, this is no complaint against, <laughs> against the generals. They want the best conceivable weapons that they can get uh, for their armies. Um, contrary to popular belief, generals do not like fighting wars in the sense that uh, it tends to destroy an army or, or armed forces which they have built up over a long period of time. And therefore they are the mo most concerned, I think, of all people to ensure that if wars have to be fought, they are fought with the maximum uh, uh, efficiency, uh, with the best weapons that are available, and with the minimum uh, amount of bloodshed. But all this is, I'm afraid, extremely expensive. Uh, and occasionally, therefore, the politicians have to call a halt on uh, this sort of expenditure. And what we have therefore been trying to do, as far as uh, our defense expenditure is concerned, is first of all, put a limit on how much we are prepared to spend. And the limit we've put on it is around 6% of our gross national product. Uh, in cash terms, that means an expenditure in 1968-69 of, by Britain of around 2,200 million pounds. Uh, it's far and away the largest single spending ministry uh, in uh, the whole of, of, uh, of the government machine in Britain. 
Uh, secondly, what we have been trying to do is relate our defense expenditure to a total review of all our commitments. We have withdrawn already from a number of those commitments. We are out of Aden, uh, I'm very happy and relieved to say. Uh, we ended up in Aden in the most impossible position with uh, around 20,000 British troops supposedly there to protect a base, in fact there virtually to protect themselves, uh, uh, and sitting in the middle with uh, an argument going on between three rival groups of nationalist organizations in South Yemen, uh, the official South Arabian government, which was the first one, the National Liberation Front, which was the second one, and a somewhat delightfully named organization called FLOSI, which was the Federation for the Liberation of Occupied South Yemen. And British troops were therefore sitting in the middle, uh, virtually in the middle of a war between the National Liberation Front and FLOSI, being shot at from both sides, getting credit from neither, uh, protecting nothing save themselves, uh, and looking at a base which, frankly, we didn't need. And therefore, uh, I'm terribly relieved to say we are out. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, if the Aden people want Aden, well, from my point of view, they can have it, and willingly. <laughs> um, other decisions we took were to cancel some very expensive aircraft. We were developing uh, a thing called the TSR-2. Very expensive, very good airplane. The only trouble is it would have cost around six million pounds per aircraft. Uh, and even looking at the TFX or the F-111, uh, which some of which we're buying off you, that's a very, very expensive uh, airplane indeed. So we chopped that. Um, we had to pay about 100 million in penalty uh, uh, payments in order to do that. But nevertheless, it was worth it, looked at as a, on the larger scale. As I said, we didn't build a carrier, which was uh, ordered. Uh, we have taken decisions to get out of Singapore. Um, this is not an easy decision to take, Singapore. It's a, 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 an area which Britain has been concerned with for a long time, uh, which we know, which knows us, which on the whole likes us, and I think an area in which we can and have played quite an important part. But we don't need, we reckon, uh, a large base for ground troops in Singapore. Uh, the basis for this is a very simple proposition, which is that uh, on the whole we have come to the conclusion that the security of Asia has to be secured by Asians rather than by uh, people like ourselves, perhaps 12 or 14,000 miles away. Uh, and frankly, to put three or four British divisions back into an area like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, we think would probably be counterproductive uh, rather than helpful. That it does come a time in this sort of exercise when the presence of troops becomes an irritant rather than an aid. And when it becomes an irritant rather than an aid, well, then uh, I think one has to look again at the, the, the situation you find yourself in, the principles upon which uh, you originally got involved. And we have taken a, a quite deliberate decision that we will not commit large quantities of ground troops on our own uh, into uh, Asia again. We will not, in other words, do another Indonesian-Malaysian confrontation in the way that it was done before. Uh, we think that the, the Asians themselves, the Malaysians, if it happens again, they would have to provide the ground troops. We would be prepared prepared to provide the sophisticated weaponry like air cover, naval cover, which they can't provide themselves. Uh, this we would be perfectly prepared to do, but we're not going to send 60,000 uh, British infantrymen and artillerymen uh, out into Borneo again. And therefore, having taken that sort of decision, it does mean, therefore, you don't need the base. If you don't need the base, you've got to get out of it. There's no point in spending 40 million a year on a base that you don't need. On the other hand, Singapore's economy has been tied to that base now for uh, 60 or 70 years. Uh, Singapore's a very small island, got a very good government, certainly the least corrupt and the most stable government in Southeast Asia and potentially one of the best. And therefore, the way in which you withdraw, how you withdraw, the timing of the withdrawal, the economic effects of the withdrawal, these are all very important and are things, as I say, that one has to consider. Well, I'm conscious of the fact I've already spoken for longer than I said I was going to. I'm afraid this is an occupational hazard of audiences of politicians. Uh, politicians, particularly lawyer politicians, always tend to go on rather more uh, than they, 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 they said they would. But can I try and sum the whole thing up in, in one or two sentences, which I'm afraid must necessarily be rather sketchy because I, I, I won't be able to, to develop it. 
I suppose that in terms of the role that Britain is now hacking out for herself in the world, uh, we are dealing with the residue of a colonial empire. Uh, it has been said, and I think with a great deal of force, that Britain is the only nation on earth that acquired an empire almost by accident and has given it up by design. Uh, I always remember the story of Palmerston's, I think, second or third ministry, I've forgotten which one it was, when he tried to find somebody to take the colonial office. And uh, he went round all the people who would normally have been appointed. None of them were prepared to take the job. So in the end, he turned to his secretary and he said, oh, well, I suppose I'll have to do it myself. You'd better bring the maps and show me where all these damn places are. <laughs> um, I don't think that the whole of British imperial history was quite so casual, but nevertheless, I think that we did acquire vast tracts of the globe, uh, as I say, almost accidentally, certainly, uh, I believe, uh, with no, no great malice attached to it. Uh, whether they were right or wrong, uh, I'm convinced of one thing, and that is that Britain administered its empire with what it believed to be scrupulous fairness and absolute justice. Uh, they may have been wrong, they may have been right, but within the lights of the people who went out from Britain, uh, to colonize vast areas of the globe. Uh, they did it, uh, in my experience, and there are few families in Britain who do not have at least some connection with some part of the old, uh, of, of, of the old British Empire. Uh, I come from a small mining valley in South Wales. Uh, my father was an engineer. His father was a Welsh Methodist preacher, and so was his father before him. So I suppose that really I'm descended from a long line of Methodist divines. But nevertheless, in... in uh, even in my family, uh, we, have, uh, we had a great uncle who built uh, a large number of bridges uh, in India for the British Army. Uh, my wife, uh, um, her family, uh, two of them were killed in fighting uh, in, in India in the, at the turn of the century. Uh, her father was in the army, spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and in Burma, and this sort of thing. And therefore, the, the, there is a, a direct connection, I think, a great deal of connection between ordinary people living in Great Britain uh, and areas of the globe uh, far away from uh, our own islands. But nevertheless, one has to recognize and accept, and I accept it and recognize it thankfully and gratefully, that in 1968, it is neither possible nor desirable for a nation such as mine to attempt to go on governing vast areas of the world's surface. I think we have a very important part to play in areas of the world well outside Great Britain. I think we, uh, my country has a, a considerable degree of expertise, uh, of experience, uh, in dealing with parts of the globe which are perhaps rather remote, uh, like, shall we say, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, parts of Africa, this, this, this sort of area. And I think the Commonwealth is therefore an important organization. I think it can be overrated, but there's a dreadful tendency at the moment to write it off totally which I, I am not prepared to, to, to go along with. But I suppose that the really hard and fundamental decision that has been taken for Britain is to give our islands a real change of direction. And what Britain is now doing is changing its direction back onto its own continent. I do not think people should uh, underrate or underestimate for one moment the real fundamental importance of our approaches to the European Economic Community. Uh, the French have kept us out now twice. Um, General de Gaulle uh, vetoed us recently for the second time. Well, uh, he is 77 and a half. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I, I hasten to add, I wish General de Gaulle no ill. Um, on the contrary, I hope the President of France has a long, early, and happy retirement. But, you know, I, <laughs> uh, I will be grateful when he leaves the Elysee. But, um, nevertheless, despite the fact that he's kept us, I ought, I suppose, as a cautionary note to say, however, that uh, some recent research was done in the Foreign Office in London on the uh, longevity of the males in the de Gaulle family. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm sorry to have to report that we, we found that on average they live to 83 and a half, but um, <laughs> however. Uh, 
Perhaps the general may prove an exception, but of course exceptions can be on either side of the average line. <laughs> However, uh, to be serious about it for a moment, uh, despite these difficulties, these local difficulties we have with the French, uh, nevertheless, I, I do think that there has been a profound and deep change of direction by Great Britain in its approach uh, to world problems. Uh, we do see ourselves now as playing a, a, an increasing part in developing the unity of our own continent. If by the end of the century, Europe is united economically and possibly politically, we then have one unit of over 300 million people larger than either of the two present superpowers, larger than the Soviet Union, larger than the United States of America. And as far as we are concerned, it would be a unit which we know, which is close to us, which we appreciate, which we understand, which likes our goods, which buys an increasing amount of goods from us, with whom we are increasingly integrated militarily in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and therefore uh, with which we would, we believe, increasingly be able to work. Um, if England were 22 miles off the coast of Maine and not 22 miles off the coast of Calais, uh, no doubt other considerations would apply. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, were it possible to uproot Great Britain and move it 3,000 miles across the Atlantic, this is something which I would be very pleased indeed to consider. But uh, unfortunately, um, we are, or fortunately as the case may be, uh, if you like to look at it, we are 22 miles off the coast of France. Uh, and Europe is, there is a movement towards unity in Europe which is taking place, uh, and it's a movement to which, in which uh, I believe Britain can and should play a, an increasing part. And therefore, changing Britain is what I started with. We started with miniskirts and maxi skirts, which, interesting, are perhaps not wholly significant in the political development uh, of, of the next 50 years. Economically, I think our difficulties have been overrated. Uh, I think our performance tends to be underestimated. I think decisions are being taken which will put it right, which will shortly be announced. Politically and internationally, I think Britain has given up its role as an imperial power, nevertheless has a considerable part to play in areas of the world remote from Europe, like the Far East. But I think the, the sort of role that we can play there uh, is no longer a purely military one, but maybe uh, perhaps in terms of experience, expertise, guidance, and assistance, and that sort. Uh, and that our real change of direction has been onto what is, after all, our own continent, Europe. And that uh, I, speaking as a fairly youngish politician in England, uh, believe that the sort of things we ought to be working for uh, increasingly in Britain are a greater degree of economic and political interdependence and, Europe, and unity on the continent of Europe itself. Now, I'm sorry I talked far too long, but I will now try and answer some of your questions.